So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Elena So hi, my name is Elena Francisson. I'm a faculty member at the University of Haifa. And I'll tell you about work I'm um, doing in collaboration with uh, Professor Lydia Gabis, um, Josh Gudad, and Abshah Hamdiyat, and Tim and Kiran Ilan, and the Ministry of Health's Teamna platform, which is a big uh, data initiative that enables this wonderful uh, work to be done. So as um, uh, Dorit uh, told you, I'm interested in, um, in studying uh, clinically relevant uh, machine learning models that can actually uh, help and not replace, but help clinicians in getting a bird's eye view on this complex and heterogeneous uh, phenotype uh, that we call today autism spectrum disorders. Maybe one day we'll be able to call them different uh, things. Um, where did we start? So back uh, like 15 years ago, um, I got a large grant from the European Union and naively wanted to study um, in the national health system, early uh, screening for autism with paper. We once did paper and pencil uh, questionnaires back in those days. And this is the letter I got back. Um, as you know, I debated about your request to conduct the above survey at the baby clinics. On one hand, it is important to public health. On the other hand, it may impose a provider's responsibility for addressing questions given the gap between screening and diagnostic testing. I considered these two sides, and I wish you luck doing this elsewhere. Um, so that wasn't very encouraging. Um, but I learned a lot from uh, the journey with the Ministry of Health, first of all, that the system is overburdened by many tasks, many children, and many health conditions and other environmental risk conditions that um, are at um, this crossroads uh, of the Tipa the baby wellness clinics. Um, it's a defensive, also legally, there are legal aspects to this, and uh, we're not ready for uh, something too um, aggressive that will change practice. So uh, can ChatGPT help us with this, or um, really technology that could personalize the process to the risk uh, of the family, the specific risk of that family, and um, we're able to prompt the provider to sort of ask another question. So take into consideration all the profiles in the system and sort of say, okay, let's ask one more question and maybe do um, an autism-specific screener to specific children with uh, different risk uh, levels. So we are, where are we uh, today with early screening? Um, we are really basing, although we have we heard really wonderful genetic talks uh, this morning, um, we are doing observations. So either the parent is doing the observation or we as clinicians are looking at babies and trying to figure out who is at risk uh, for autism, who has elevated uh, markers. Age of diagnosis is uh, above three years, not only in Israel, worldwide. And the motivator is to get kids as early as possible to intervention. We know intervention is associated with better outcomes, and Israel is a great example for really high quality of early intervention uh, programs. Um, machine learning and ASD, so really interesting uh, works of uh, Kohane from uh, Children's Hospital looking at using machine learning to classify medical comorbidities of children already diagnosed with autism. Uh, in Israel, there's been uh, with a large uh, database of an HMO work uh, of uh, detecting risk from histories of family members and uh, a few works with home videos. Okay, so home videos for early detection um, of uh, risk. So why do we need machine learning for ASD detection? First of all, our providers um, who are doing developmental uh, monitoring really uh, vary in their ASD expertise, have very little time and many tasks to do in, in their visits. And when, uh, when we did the, uh, the work back in 2011, we saw great heterogeneity among typically developing kids. And this has been documented in the literature as well, and even if you take NCHAT behaviors, 
which is the gold standard for screening, and you look at typical development, you see variations uh, also there. So we really are looking for um, an approach that can capture uh, this heterogeneity uh, in neurotypical development as well as the different trajectories that are associated with autism. So we know not all kids with autism start uh, the same. So the goal of uh, our research was first to build a model that could leverage the big data of the Tipot Chalab, the baby wellness clinics, and use a machine learning algorithm to sort of focus um, on important predictors. Um, now the unique part of this project is that we're not looking um, at one type of marker, we're looking at growth, at birth parameters, at developmental milestones, taking whatever was recorded for that child throughout the years. So let's get to the uh, database. So the database we looked at are children born from 2014 to 2019 and are from the Ministry of Health's baby wellness database, uh, about 780,000 uh, records. Our outcome was autism versus not. We looked at ICD-9 codes. We looked at um, text mentioning the child was diagnosed with autism. And uh, we found uh, about 1,200 kids with autism uh, that they had autism recorded um, at that point in uh, their record. And for our model, we took only kids diagnosed after the age of two. So we took all their data up to age two as predictors, and then there are only uh, kids who were diagnosed over the age of two to minimize data leakage. Um, I gave you some numbers, and you can see that our data is behaving as expected in terms of the higher rate of boys, higher rate of um, premature births, and um, uh, lower rate of spontaneous uh, birth. Um, I forgot to note that we took out um, uh, about 4,000 kids who had other developmental uh, disorders, significant ones uh, like Down syndrome, uh, that, and did not have indication of autism in their records. So in our, in our model, there are 100 features. Yeah, it's a round number. Um, it really is 100. Um, and it's a mixture of familial features like um, multiple pregnancies, maternal age, birth parameters, uh, birth weight, pregnancy week, um, gender, postnatal factors like nursing, anemia, postpartum depression, parental concerns, and most importantly, 38 developmental milestones that are recorded um, up to the age of two years. Well, wow, and they are <laughs> very messy, I must say, and that's, uh, that, that's the wonder of working with real clinical data. Um, there are many factors that go into the recording of this data. Uh, but super interesting and uh, rich to learn from, and growth parameters. Based on um, uh, multiple iterations, we ended up with a model that had 14 features that were most important, with an AUC of uh, 0.86, and um, we did a three-fold cross-validation using an algorithm called gradient boosting that could sort of deal with the Im very imbalanced nature of our data. And as you can see here, um, uh, we have a, a, different, uh, a difference uh, with uh, overall higher specificity than uh, sensitivity. So I'm sure this is the most interesting part for for um, uh, you know, for, for those of you working uh, with uh, young kids, um, I'll start with the things that didn't surprise us, which was uh, being a boy. Okay, being a boy increases the risk of uh, uh, being in this uh, predictor model. Um, but then the developmental milestones that we're looking at in yellow, you can see here, is composes two word sentences, uh, vocabulary of at least ten words builds a tower of cubes, points at familiar objects upon the quest, and eats independent. We are really a mixture of um, uh, fine motor language and social uh, behaviors in the second year of life. So these are two visits, the 12 to 18 months and 18 uh, to 24 months. Um, surprisingly, response to name, um, uh, which is the classic uh, sort of uh, indicator, is not in here. 
and um, eye contact, which is also sort of a classic one. Um, but when we look at, again, a bird's eye view of all kids, um, this is what we're seeing. In terms of other features, you can see mother age is uh, our best proxy for father age, probably. There are no fathers in people of Kharab, apparently. Um, and there is no family history for autism. Um, so that would be my first recommendation at an administrative level to add those very simple uh, fields into the record. Um, I will say that Pregnancy Week had a contribution, not on the top five, but did contribute. And I'll show you here um, the direction of things with the SHAP uh, plot here. And you can see that um, one of the surprising uh, factors that we're studying um, more uh, in detail is nursing. So if you ever uh, had nursing or not, um, was associated with autism. And we tried to make that go away, but that just didn't happen. And now we ran the model only with boys. Um, a reviewer asked us you know, to run it only, you know, except really for girls and boys. We don't have enough girls. So we ran it only with boys, and that keeps on coming in. So um, it's, it's a fascinating uh, factor. And you can see here that in terms of growth parameters, we do see head circumference, um, last head circumference percentile, and the standard deviation of the head percentile, of, uh, a larger one, was associated with uh, elevated risk. And because uh, we're very interested in the important milestones, I sort of broke them down here also by prematurity, because I wanted to show, or first to determine, and then to show you guys that really the, the, the filled lines are the premature kids. Okay, So we have in red the autism in blue, the typically developing kids. We can see that prematurity contributes to a developmental delay, but the big story is the autism, not autism, in terms of the rates of fail. One of the items here entered actually as rate of past. Um, so we have here both uh, prematurity contributes to the delay and a mix of developmental domains. I think the fine motor ones are really fascinating. They're classified as fine motor, although when we think about uh, independently eating with a spoon, the ASQ, which is a gold standard developmental screener, for example, puts it under personal social. Because there are motivations other than you know the eye-hand coordination that drive that capacity. So I wouldn't look at the fine motor ones as indicators of dyspraxia, per se, or motor delay, but um, um, they might tell us some story about social motivation, social engagement. And uh, not all kids are delayed here. Not all kids with autism have uh, a delay, even in this uh, sort of very um, top one, over 10 words uh, failed. We still have 50% of the kids with autism who are passing that milestone. So um, uh, this is really uh, something we are trying to understand more in depth in terms of how we can capture in the model a developmental delay. I'll just uh, say, uh, for those of you who are working with Tifat Khalaf data, um, when we look at age of first performed, which is sort of a measure of delay, we're missing out all the kids who, fit, who, who always fit. So we wanted to capture as many kids with autism as we could in our model and um, uh, we, we decided about uh, to, to run with uh, the dichotomous um, approach, but clearly there's more work to be done to capture the delay. So our take-home message uh, for practice, baby wellness records are really noisy, um, but have a great potential both as a public health um, cross, crossroad for all populations uh, to advance uh, early <coughs> detection. Uh, the higher um, uh, specificity versus sensitivity, uh, we are uh, looking at different thresholds now of the model to see maybe at specific healthcare context we'll want to change uh, the threshold of the model. And the interesting part, we had really a nice mixture of growth uh, growth parameters, birth parameters, um, uh, developmental milestones that entered as the top important ones, although out of the 14 features, I think six or seven were developmental milestones, uh, which is uh, dramatic. Um, and um, I think the last point here is if we can embed ASD decision support systems in the electronic health records, 
using such models, we could actually uh, think of an uh, ideal world of, of the provider being prompted to ask another question that's missing to sort of uh, put the puzzle, puzzle pieces together. And in terms of ASDEHR studies, uh, the longitudinal nature of the data is very valuable, so there are big variabilities in visit uh, attendance and um, record uh, richness. Um, we limited, we included only kids who had at least two years of data, so that's why we could take only 2019, because we wanted them to have at least two years of data uh, for, um, for uh, the model. Um, and the, the strength of population data for ASD research is huge. I, I didn't have time and, uh, to go into uh, all the differences we found between different sectors. Um, uh, for example, uh, kids, uh, families uh, from the Soviet Union had a, a much higher rate of autism relative to the rate in the population. Um, and again, I wanted that to go away, but um, we looked at it, it wasn't a mistake, and we uh, are trying to understand what that means, not only at the autism phenotype level, but also as, you know, how we as providers feel comfortable telling parents, um, go check your child for uh, something. And the data is really not only telling us about the health condition, but also about practice. And just an example of just recording where the autism diagnosis is, you would think everyone would be in the ICD-9 codes, but no. There were, um, uh, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but at least a few hundreds that were based on text um, uh, that we identified uh, those kids. And I want to say there are many more kids in, our, in, in, in the data probably that have autism, either because they're too young we don't have um, their data, because I would expect at least um, uh, seven times more uh, kids with autism, and we're working uh, to uh, replicate this uh, model with a larger um, sort of wide label um, of kids with autism. So thank you for your listening and thank you to our